Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's, and thank you so much for being here with us in God's house today. Today is Saints Triumphant Sunday, and if you'll notice, uh, we've got a different color up front. On the pyramids, on the stole, it's white. That white is not to warn us of upcoming snow. That white is to remind us of holiness and heaven. The holiness and heaven that Jesus won for us and has given to his saints who have already left this world and has in store for you and me too, the triumph we have with him. We'll follow along with the order of worship as it's printed out for you in the worship folder and also projected on the screen. Let's begin with our first hymn, Jerusalem the Golden. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Through faith in Jesus, God has declared us to be saints. Although we are truly saints, while we live here on earth, we are at the same time also sinners. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, let us confess our sins to him and trust his promise to forgive us. Lord God, I confess that I have been born an unworthy sinner. In countless ways I have sinned against your majesty, 
and have fallen short of your glory. I have not loved and served you as I should, nor have I loved and served others as you command. By nature I am nothing but a sinner, and sin is all I can do. In your mercy and according to your promise, Lord, forgive me. Do not remember my sins, but remember Jesus, who washed my sins away and made me holy in your sight. Saints of God, the almighty and majestic Lord has heard your prayers and has forgiven you. On the cross, Jesus bore your sin, shame, and guilt and endured the punishment you deserved. By his innocent suffering and death, he has washed your sins away, and by his life and resurrection, he has made you holy and freed you from death and the grave. Thanks be to God. We join with all the saints in heaven and on earth as we praise God for his great mercy and love. Almighty God and Savior, you have set the final day and hour when we shall be delivered from the world of sin and death. Keep us ever watchful for the coming of your Son, that we may sit with him and all your holy ones at the marriage feast in heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson for today comes from Revelation chapter 19 and will serve as the basis for our sermon. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. 
He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. This is the word of our God. We continue with the solo.
Please stand in honor of the gospel. None of us knows what day we will leave this world, and none of us knows what day Jesus will return. That's why he urges us in the gospel for today to be watchful, to be ready for him. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our next hymn, Wake Awake.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega. Amen. God's word for our sermon we consider in Revelation 19. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. This year, there's been a lot of mixed emotions, mixed feelings about weddings. Jealous that they didn't plan their wedding for last year before all of this 2020 started. Nervous about putting down deposits and spending money on things that might for one reason or another need to be canceled. Annoyed. Uh, that the pandemic just hasn't finally cleared out, dragging out, taking so long. Maybe concerned about how the marriage will go, wondering how life together for that new bride and groom will play out. So many different mixed emotions and mixed feelings about weddings this year. Yet God talks to you and me his saints today, about the wedding to end all weddings. A wedding that we can be firm in our feelings about. Uh, We can have excited emotions and be focused in our feelings. No mixed attitudes necessary. This is going to be a huge wedding, an in-person wedding with no chance of being postponed or being forced to go virtual. We're invited. This is going to be so amazing and so great, it will be just plain right. So today, God wants to encourage you and me in this wedding to come, that wedding is going to be an outright joyful wedding between Mrs. Wright and Mr. Wright. The first section of Revelation 19, verses 1 through 9 or 1 through 10, contrasts for us Mrs. Wrong and Mrs. Right. We've probably all known someone that we are thankful that our child didn't end up marrying or grateful that we ourselves didn't end up with. Well, this woman that John speaks about, the most terrifying woman ever to end up with, he speaks here of the great prostitute who corrupts the people of this earth with her adulteries, and has even shed the blood of God's servants. This great prostitute is those of the visible church who have sold themselves spiritually away from God, who have seduced others away from God, and who have even slain those who won't go and hook up with her. The previous two chapters of Revelation tell us more about this great prostitute, how she has influence over peoples and authority over nations, how she's in bed with secular authorities and infatuated with worldly wealth, how she tries to corrupt and pollute God's word while also promoting popular human ideas, how she tries to get people to go after their own works and embrace those while enticing them away from Christ's work. This woman is just wrong. And as God paints this picture for us in Revelation, he wants us to make no mistake that she is detestable to God and dangerous and deadly for us. She is just wrong so that when her smoke goes up Forever and ever, there is great rejoicing in heaven. And here's where our feelings have sometimes been tuned to the wrong frequency. Because as we listen to this description, uh, we may bristle at it a little bit. Isn't that a little bit harsh? Uh, Couldn't God have just locked this woman up, put her away, put her out of her misery, but instead incinerating her so that her smoke goes up forever and ever? Well, that's because you and I each have been charmed by her. In our generation that celebrates all kinds of religious diversity 
in our generation that preaches tolerance for every way of life, uh, that shuns and shames those who dissent from that approach, that degrades the word of God, our love for God has been smoldering and stagnant and cooled. In this generation, you and I have been charmed by her. We have shared in her desire and obsession for political alliances, her fascination with worldly wealth, her pursuit of pleasures here in this earth. She is just wrong for us. But that's why it makes us squirm to see her punished like this because that should be our end too. We have flirted with her and cheated on God. We have been wrong. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus looks at you and me and says, you're right. You wear the fine linen, bright and clean, It's been given to you, to the saints. Jesus talks about what this fine linen is here. It says that that fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Probably better translated would be the righteous verdicts pronounced on God's holy people. Because this isn't stuff that we've done. This is what's been given to us. It's not something that we were born with or something that we earned or deserved. It's something that was given to us as a gift. And this means that we are not just all right as in okay, but we are all right as in not guilty, judged righteous by God. We received this verdict from God the judge himself. We received this verdict because Jesus took our sentence at the cross This verdict was given to us, certified at Jesus' empty tomb, at his open grave when he rose from the dead. This verdict was given to you in your baptism when you were washed clean of all of your sins by the Holy Spirit through the promises of God's word in baptism. This verdict was given to you and is given to you each time you receive Jesus' body and blood in communion. This verdict is given to you whenever a called worker or another Christian, announces forgiveness to you in Jesus' name. Verdict after verdict after verdict pronounced on you saying that you are right, so that whether you are young or old, male or female, you, through faith, are the bride of Christ, Mrs. Wright. And when God looks at you and that fine linen, he sees that you have no spot, no stain, no wrinkle or any other blemish, You are right, right with God. When you go to a wedding reception, there at the tables, everyone is seated, and the bride and groom finally arrive. The DJ turns up some exciting music with with a nice beat to it. Everybody starts cheering and roaring with thunderous applause. The wedding has come. The, The bride and groom are here. It's time to celebrate. That is the scene that God paints before us, that that he asks you and me to look forward to today as he gives us this glimpse into heaven in Revelation. Because it's the wedding of the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God who is true and right, the Lamb of God who won't let us down, doesn't lie to us. This is the truth. This is yours and mine This is the scene where our seat at the table is reserved, where we will proclaim Jesus' amazing greatness along with Lenora and Janice and Jerry and Earl and Vernetta and Myron at the great wedding of the Lamb where it is nothing but outright joy for God's people, for the saints, for you and me, as the bride of Christ, Mrs. Wright. But Revelation also, this section, talks about Mr. Wright. Usually in our culture, on a wedding day, the bride gets the spotlight. 
doesn't she? Uh, there's usually more effort and care and expense taken with the bride's dress and her hair and her makeup. And brides look amazing on their wedding day. And when they come into the church, what happens? Everyone stands and turns and faces them. Rightly so. Brides receive this honor, uh, and their husband is happy to see that as he loves her, puts her ahead of himself. But this wedding scene in Revelation, the groom has the spotlight. Jesus, he gets the glory, he gets the praise. It's all because of him. As the clouds part and the heavens open, there he is riding on a white horse, on that mighty steed, galloping. Jesus, who is called faithful and true. That means he, he never lets us down. He is always faithful to his word and his promises. Jesus was faithful to appear the first time to take sins away. And he will be true to appear this second time, referred to in Revelation, to take us away from this sinful world. He was faithful to ride humbly on a donkey into Jerusalem. He will be true to appear on a mighty steed with strength and power. He was faithful to come and make peace between you and me and God the first time he came. He will be true to come again and wage war. With justice, he judges and wages war. Uh, the word for justice could also be translated as upright or righteous or, or right. That means this is Mr. Right. This is Jesus who is right what we needed, exactly right as he wages this war, exactly right as he judges at the end of time. How different that is from the wars that are waged here between countries and kings. Or You can always question their motives. Are, are they just preying on the weak? Are, are they hungry for power? Not Jesus. He is right as he wages war. None of the wicked will be able to escape his blazing eyes, his wrath that will overtake them. Jesus wears many crowns on his head, uh, those diadems which many earthly rulers down through history have used to claim divine authority. No, nope, that's Jesus. He alone has divine authority. As Jesus comes, a, a sharp sword coming out of his mouth, sword of the law, which cuts through excuses and pronounces curses on the evil. Jesus exalted in the eternal Lord. We can't fully comprehend him. None of us down here can. A name which no one understands but he himself. Jesus, the word of God, the one who reveals to us what's really on God's mind, what God stands for, God's heart. He first came in grace and truth. He will come again to judge and make war. Even though all the armies and hosts of heaven follow after Jesus, riding on white horses, also wearing white linen, Jesus alone leads the charge. Jesus alone fights the battle. Jesus' robes alone are dipped in blood. Jesus treads the winepress alone. And even though all the other enemies of God, they line up for battle, they mobilize for war, it's really a foregone conclusion. It's going to be a bloodbath and a victory to Jesus. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is far above any earthly ruler. He's way above us, over us, who will reign with him in heaven. King of kings and Lord of lords. As this vision of Mr. Wright unfolded, imagine what John would have been thinking. John, as he was exiled there on Patmos, the apostle John who outlived all the other apostles, John, who probably received word of their martyrdom, the other apostles, as they were put to death for their faith. John, as he lived under a corrupt government that was persecuting Christians like him. How discouraged John could have been. 
And the other early Christians, too, who were persecuted and imprisoned and publicly insulted and humiliated, they didn't see victory here in this life. And God's people down through the generations who were stoned to death or sawed in half or put to death with the sword, they called out to God, When will you avenge our blood, the blood of the martyrs that was shed? All the way down to you and me. The longer we are in this world, the less victorious it looks. More violence, more war, floods and fires, diseases, sicknesses, wild, widespread. More people falling away from the faith, more false religions spreading and permeating, more people dying every day. Yet this vision, this vision of the outright joyful wedding is for you and me. It's for us to inspire joy because it's where God will right all the wrongs. It's where Jesus will bring triumph for all the defeat that it feels like we've experienced here. It's where Jesus will bring us victory. Jesus, the one who was beaten with a rod, he will wield a sword. Jesus, who was unjustly crucified, will now justly make war. Jesus, who was killed but then rose from the dead, he will come and put an end to life here for all the unbelieving nations. This is Jesus, Mr. Right, who will come to bring outright joy for us. When we look at worldly weddings, earthly weddings that happen here, there's so many mixed emotions. We're happy for the couple, but we know they're going to face sadness as they go throughout life. Some will struggle with anger and arguments, others with finances. Some will struggle with sickness, others with betrayal. Yet this wedding that you and I are invited to will put an end to all sin and sorrow, all trial and temptation, all disease and death will be no more, only joy. Blessed are we who are invited to this wedding. Happy are we when we will arrive at this wedding. Glad will we be as we celebrate at this wedding forever. So let's stay awake. Let's keep watch. Let's wait for this wedding with joy. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the response of prayer. Lord of eternity and King of saints, all the heavens adore you. Saints and angels sing before you. You clothe us with garments of splendor. You bless us with grace and mercy in this life and eternal glory forever. What undeserved love you show us. We thank you, Lord, that you have made us your saints. Encourage us by your gracious promises. Forgive our failures to live as you desire. Strengthen the faith of all who are weak and wandering. Give us power to live. Your saints will triumph forever in new heavens and a new earth. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. 
we anticipate with joy an eternity of perfect fellowship with you. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private and then public petitions. Dear God, thank you for saving Louisa Egan, daughter of Jake and Wendy, through the washing of rebirth and renewal later today by the Holy Spirit. Please watch over the entire family. Now, buried with Christ, may Louisa always live a new life in Christ and have the courage to exalt Christ in life and in death. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in every generation. We praise you for allowing Agnes, the mother of Sherry Hansen, to celebrate her 102nd birthday earlier this month. Thank you for the gift of time with loved ones here and the ability to care for parents when they depend on us. You are so gracious, Lord, to care for us in every stage of life. Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life. Please watch over Christy Ike's family, whose grandmother, Grace Yeager, you called to glory this past week. Fill the entire family with the same joyful faith that you instilled in grace and give them a blessed reunion with her and with you in heaven. Lord of life, the day is coming when you will come down from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. On that glorious day, the saints triumphant will rise in bright array, clothed in your perfect righteousness. Give us strength until that day when we will share. In the name of Jesus, we join together to pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn. my heavenly Father, the one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God of all comfort, I thank you that you have revealed to me your dear Son, Jesus Christ, in whom I have believed, whom I have proclaimed and confessed, whom I have loved and praised. 
but whom all the godless dishonor, persecute, and slander. I ask you, my dear Lord Jesus, let my soul be entrusted to you. O Heavenly Father, if I must soon leave my body and be taken out of this life, I know this for sure, that I will remain with you eternally, and no one can tear me out of your hands. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in God's house for worship today. Thank you also to those of you who joined us online or are watching on cable TV. Uh, after service today, if you're able to stick around and see if any more cleaning volunteers are needed, we greatly appreciate your assistance with that. Uh, today we continue with the second of two open forums uh, regarding the potential building project and the work of the Long Range Plan Planning Committee, getting things ready for that. So we invite you to that. That will also be live streamed as well. Uh, then we have the MLHS uh, campaign update video. Greetings from your Manitowoc Lutheran High School. We hope you are well. Here at MLHS, God continues to be our source of guidance and comfort, which our students are hearing every day in their classes. Our Building Our Future on Christ ministry campaign continues to move forward with the same goals as before. Although campaign activity was significantly reduced over the last six months because of the pandemic, the support from our Federation members and others for the building expansion plans at MLHS has not wavered. We are encouraged to know that God is still giving us the opportunities to achieve our goals of a new chapel and main entrance, an additional gymnasium, and retirement of our existing debt. In fact, by the end of the year, we will have already accomplished one of those goals, paying off our existing debt of over $500,000. Praise be to God for his bountiful goodness. Our steering committee continues to make plans and consult with architects and experts to determine the best course of action moving forward. And we hope to share information along these lines with you soon. And as always, we look to God for his direction. We ask for your continued prayers and financial support of our ministry campaign at this crucial time. With your help, we will discover all that God has planned for us please contact the MLHS school office to arrange a personal or group presentation about the campaign. God's word in Jeremiah chapter 29, our campaign theme verse, is especially appropriate. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. May God keep you in his care. Are there any other announcements that should be highlighted this morning? If not, please greet those around you and God's blessings on your day. <laughs> 